There we go. So we've already had the introduction, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> okay, so the first question I'm just going to ask is, have you used a clicker system before? Um, so there are two ways of yeah, getting into this thing. You don't need to register yourself. You just need to know that me and my poll EV ID, which is Andrew Robbins 875, uh, so, so you can either text my, my ID to 37607 or, as most of the students do, is actually use the web-based interface. And if you have a phone, um, the phone app, for instance, it just says, um, you know, log in to Andrew Robbins 875. And if I do, then now I get, have you used a clicker before? So this is the Android app. I don't know about the iPhone apps, but I'm assuming they're pretty, pretty similar. And so if I respond to this, okay, so I've swung it two to one there. So maybe I'll, um, I'll clear my response as I'm biasing the sample size here. And it's a small, it's a small sample, so we don't really want to do that. <laughs> So most of the students use this interface, as far as I can see. There's a few of them are using laptops, but most of them seem to be using their phones. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff talked about not allowing students to use phones in the classroom and laptops in the classroom. I'm a firm believer in they're going to have them there anyway. We might as well make use of them and get them to do something positive with them. Okay, so that's how it, uh, uh, so that's how it goes. Okay, so we've got three people responded so far. Are you okay? Any issues? Everybody clicked who wants to click? Yep. Okay. Right. So that's basically a, a sample of how to do it. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how, it, how I do icebreakers and things uh, in a little while. So why do we use one? Well, you know, like when you, when you buy a house, location, location, location are the three things. Well, why do you use a classroom response system? Pedagogy, pedagogy, pedagogy. Do not use it just because it's cool. Okay, that is a disaster waiting to happen. You have to think about how you're going to apply it to your particular class and their particular needs. In my case, that uh, I have two types of classes. One are the science students taking physics. And they're not the physics majors, they're the biologists, neuroscientists. So they're people who are taking a physics course involuntarily because they've got to. And many of them lack confidence. And so a lot of it is the confidence building that they can do simple calculations and things so that they can get into it. Many of them, many of them dropped physics in grades 9 or 10, get to university, and it's a rude shock when they find they've got to take a, a physics course, which is essentially not much more than a review of grade 12, but even so, you know, it causes a, certainly a large amount of stress. The other group I, I teach are first year engineers, that's the class I'm teaching this term, and once again, they are possibly overconfident in their, in their knowledge, and you need to set them some quite challenging problems to make sure that they don't get the idea that it's too easy. <clears throat> so. For the students, we want to challenge them somehow. And the other thing that's very important is with a 75 or 80 minute class, we want to break up the class into manageable time chunks because we know that people's attention span is no more than about 10 minutes, 15 minutes on task. And so every so often, we want to have them doing a different task and just being told to answer a clicker question, and it usually involves some discussion with their neighbors as well. It's not just you answer the question. It's, it's more involved than that. Um, so, so that's very important. Uh, and then allowing the students to discuss with their peers, so peer-to-peer -peer instruction coming in on this as well. This has actually been uh, uh, very successful, I think, um, in terms of getting students to interact with each other in fairly small groups, because even if you've got a class of 350 and it's an enormous room, 
students always tend to sit together with their friends and after a few lectures you see little groups forming and they always discuss the problems amongst themselves and then come to conclusions and you can hear these arguments going on about you know this is the right answer no this is the right answer and of course when they explain it to each other that's when we get some sort of quality um, learning going on it reinforces what I've hopefully what I've Set, outlined a few minutes before, uh, and also it allows them to get their minds straight on the uh, on the key concepts. And then for the teacher, it very very quickly la allows you to gauge how well did that last little burst of teaching go? Did I get the concept over correctly? Um, and it means, of course, you can design the course as you want to stimulate the students more rather than because you know an 80 minute class of me talking is is really not much use after 15 minutes and you'll notice even in this seminar we're going to chunk it into a 10 or 15 you know the, there's no more than a few a few slides of me going blah 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 before we actually before you do something as well um, the gauging how well your teaching is, is going is actually really important and, and almost the first thing I found when I started using clickers many years ago, I gave this what I thought was a marvelous expedition on what's known as the right hand rule in, in physics and don't worry about it if you don't understand that, but it's quite complicated and it involves three different directions and you use your right hand to point in the right directions and I thought I'd given this brilliant exposition and I asked the students to apply it in a clicker question, and about 10% got it right. And so I immediately realized, uh, OK, that did not work. So I did another problem on the board. And then the next class, I did another problem, and 80% of them got it. So then I did another problem the next class, 95% of them got it. So you can really quickly see if something has not gone over well the first time, you can you know, regroup and say, OK, do we need more immediate reinforcement now in class, or should we wait, have a think about it, do it again next class? So you have to be a little bit, of flex little bit more flexible. It's the ultimate just-in-time teaching, if you like, because you're actually in the class. And if you're happy with improvising, which I am, that's good. But if you're not, go away and think about it. OK. This is the classic thing that happened at the University of Saskatchewan, which is where I was previously. There were several uh, professors who used the clicker. They made students buy a clicker at $25, and they only used it to click for attendance. And not surprisingly, the students hated it, because it's an extra $25. And all the professor is doing is just checking to see whether their clicker was in class. I mean, it doesn't even check whether the student was in class because some people were coming with four or five clickers, you know. Um, but you could just as easily have passed around an attendance sheet and it would have been exactly the same thing. So using it as a, a, a glorified attendance sheet is not a very good idea. And so you've got to be careful there. So you have to use them some way to modify how you're going to teach. So you're modifying a traditional lecture. And they will certainly not turn a bad class into a good class. You know, don't, you know, no technology will do that. It, if, 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 if it's badly thought out in the first place, technology at the very worst will actually make it even worse. Um, and you do need careful consideration on what the clicker exercises are to say, what's the point of this? I'm not just asking a question. I've got to decide now what sort of question do I want to ask, and what are the students going to get out of it? OK. The original classroom response system was actually flashcards. Uh, I found this example here with yes, no. I think they were reversible sort of lollipop you know, sticker things like this. A colleague of mine um, at the University of Saskatchewan used different color uh, file cards and he got student, you know, so he, they either put the blue one up or the yellow one up or the pink one up or whatever, so that he could judge whether they understood what was going on. And then he would pose a multiple choice thing and say, you know, the blue answer, the pink answer, the yellow answer, etc. Now, of course, that's a bit awkward because it's not anonymous that people can easily see what other people are, what color thing or the yes or no, what they're putting up. 
And that distracts people and they think, you know, oh, everybody else has said yes, but I really think the answer is no. And the peer pressure gets to them. What you really want with this system, and Poll Everywhere is not that great for that, I have to say. Uh, what you really want is, is it to be completely anonymous because there are always people in that class thinking, I can't answer this. I don't know the answer to this question. I am so stupid, I cannot get it. And then when the answers come up and half the class haven't got it, it's a big relief for them to say, oh, OK, I am not the only one having trouble with this concept. And then if you explain the concept, normally the second time round they get the answer uh, uh, correct. It gives you a, uh, you know, if you're, the, if you're the teacher, you can see roughly what's going on if there's a big majority or a small you know, uh, uh, proportion. But if it's a split decision, you can't really quantify it. There are some, I won't say interesting, because I think, really think it's a bit of a waste of time. There are some systems now designed in schools where people have cards with QR codes on them, and they hold them up, and they have a camera which takes a photo of the class, analyzes the QR responses, and then sort of spits the answer out to the teacher. Frankly, I, I, <laughs> frankly, I find that rather, um, you know, overkill, really. Uh, um, and I think it could be done much more simply over the uh, over the Wi-Fi and with phones. So, but anyway, so that's a different approach there. I'm certainly I've I've no intention of ever trying anything like that out because it does require you to have cards in front of you as well. And you know, students come in, they forget. Nobody forgets their phone, right? ask them to bring in anything else and they'll forget it. So the phone is actually very useful. Okay. So the first system I actually used was the turning point system. And this was back at the U of S again. And it's, it's also um, been used here as well. So you find it lurking on most of the systems. And the turning point system originally had these little clickers here uh, like this. Um, there are some more sophisticated ones with bigger LCD displays on, and, and they can get slightly fancier than that. Each of these clickers has a hard-coded ID number in hexadecimal on the back. So that's how you uh, so, that, so you have to associate that clicker ID with the student somehow. At the U of S, it was actually very well integrated into the first year program because we had an agreement uh, for the people doing a common science first year um, who typically had to do biology, physics, and chemistry. All of the first year courses agreed that we should all use the clickers. So there was an immediate large buy-in. We, we got a quantity discount because we would buy 1,000 clickers a year, um, which meant the price was down to $25. And uh, we were very lucky that our equivalent of CU Learn, which was called PAUSE, um, is they integrated this very nicely so the student could go into the equivalent of Carlton Central, register their clicker ID, and then it would automatically associate the student when they responded with the clicker ID, which is great for professors. Because if you don't have that, it's a real pain administratively. So this was, this was pretty good, and it integrated very nicely into PowerPoint as well. There was a plug-in. It worked very reliably. We trialed a few other systems, and I went to a, uh, a demonstration by a different clicker company, and they wanted the students to not only pay $25 for the clicker, but then they had to subscribe for every course as well at another $8 a term. And then the guy doing the demonstrating tried to launch the framework and then launch PowerPoint within it and the system crashed twice during the demonstration and sort of, you know, well, I think not, you know, maybe. And I, I went to the equivalent of the EDC uh, in, uh, it, it, at the U of S, which was actually in the basement of the physics building. It was extremely easy to get to. And they showed us the turning point and how it integrated into, um, uh, uh, into PowerPoint and I went down there with the head of physics and I could just see his eyes light up when he demonstrated how easy it was to work and so we immediately agreed yes we'll do this. So this was actually a good system and I think I've gone through most of these things. So what makes it easier for professors to use this is if there is buy-in from 
other levels of the university. So you really need some IT support uh, to make it easy to use because otherwise professors see it as a barrier and just won't buy into this. That you know, It's difficult enough to get professors to buy into this sort of stuff if there are hurdles, administrative hurdles and anything else like that it's it's you know it, it's very difficult um so this was pretty good and and so the turning point output sort of looks like this I'll get my oh, there we go um so these are the, so this is the device id and it's it's a hexadecimal id here and then this is the number of times it was clicked during the class and so at the u of s once you've got this uh, real device id it was automatically associated in the equivalent of CU Learn, so it was easy to keep track of who who been clicking uh, and how they've been doing. Unfortunately, at Carlton, that was not the case, and you had to do it manually, which I did it for classes of 45, and it took a lot of effort, and for larger classes, it would be practically impossible. Okay, at Carlton. They wanted to make a profit on the clickers, so they put the price up to $50, which, of course, students are already being asked to pay tuition. Physics textbooks are incredibly expensive, $350 usually for the first year textbook, some of the most expensive on campus. Asking them to pay another $50 for a clicker they might use in one course in their first year was a step too far for me, so I, I gave up with that. Um, and there's no in, there was no integration with either Carlton Central or either WebCT or now CU Learn. So I didn't like that. So I found uh, an alternative called Socrative. So creative, I think they said, but being British, I don't say that. So, um, um, and uh, this is actually quite a nice system. It's really designed for schools. I don't know if we can get this. See if the web browser will launch. No, doesn't look like we're getting it. Oh well. Okay. Now this actually works very well for anonymous polling over Wi-Fi systems. You can't text to it, so it's really designed for small rooms like this. It was designed for the K-12 environment, really, and it used to be free for small classes under 40, and so I used to use it for some of my smaller groups. Um, when I was uh, uh, when I was teaching them, and this would do pretty much what Poll Everywhere does now, but then after a couple of years, they took it off the free and made it a subscription, and you had to pay for it, particularly if you wanted a larger class, and that was just at the point where Poll where we got the Poll Everywhere license <coughs> site license for Carlton. So at that point, I gave up with Socrative, and uh, and went to Poll Everywhere instead. Let's see. Okay, so Poll Everywhere, I just borrowed this from their website. Um, I use PowerPoint, but it also works pretty well, I believe, in Keynote and Google Slides as well. So it's got most of the major presentation software covered, and you can use it in a, in a standalone mode as well through a web interface if you're, if you're not using uh, um, actual, actual slides. So, the integration was much better than Turning Point, which only had PowerPoint, and they were very slow whenever PowerPoint got an update. They were very slow on updating their plugin, and there were some issues with, with that not being um, not entirely being right. When when the new version of PowerPoint came in, the university of course put this on all the machines, and then the tur and then the uh, Turning Point stopped working, which caused more frustration. So this is pretty good, Poll Everywhere. So I'm going to talk about the PowerPoint version, so I can't really comment on the Keynote and Google Slides, but I imagine that it's a, it's a common interface, as, as far as I know. There's, there's no difference in capability. So the first thing I always do, we've already done this with that first slide here, is have some sort of icebreaker activity at the start of term. And particularly in my first year classes, which are huge, and most of the students don't know each other, it probably wouldn't be the same if you were teaching an upper, an upper year class or anything. And you want to get students to interact with small groups nearby, near, near neighbors or something like that. Um, and it's important because 
discussing it with one or two trusted people is really good for learning. But of course, there are lots of people who really don't want to talk to anybody. So it takes a while to build that level of trust up so that they'll actually say, well, what did you think? What I think this. And, and, it, and so low level activities like this, which are fairly harmless, are a good way, um, a, a good way of doing that. So, oh, it's popped out there. So this is, just a minute, let me, uh, there's supposed to be a picture of me and my tie, okay? Because <laughs> the question is, what do you think of my tie? Okay, it's got sloths on it, by the way, so. Oh, it came up, came up there and not came up there. How interesting. Okay, so there we are. So there's the tie, and I usually show people. Uh, the interest, I, I've actually only just found out that you can have these poles and then put a picture on the left. And so I, I've only done this once or twice, and I'm not sure entirely I've got the formatting uh, right. And I'm not quite sure why it's popped up over here. Oh, we've got, oh, it must be this, it's this invisible setting, which, there we go, that's better. Okay, so mostly very stylish. Yeah, that's good. That's a better response than I get from um, most of my students. I get a better response from the science students than I do from the engineering students, okay? I think the engineering students have no sense of style whatsoever. They're also mostly men, as you know, it's 80-20 it's gender split, whereas the uh, science students are about 50-50, okay? So I'm unhappy with this, why it's shifted off over there, and I'm not entirely sure why. I have, no, I have not seen that before anywhere, so anyway. Well, one thing I can say is there are these commands here so that you can do various things inside it. So for instance, I could lock the pole so nobody, nobody else could, could use it. I could also um, clear it so that we can have a revote if we, if we, uh, if we wanted to do that. Okay. <clears throat> So that's an example of a multiple choice question, and it's a bit limited for my purposes because it's text-based only, and so you can't put math or special symbols in there. And of course, for physics and engineering students, that's quite important usually. You can put a picture alongside the question, as I tried to do, and it came up on, on screen but not on, the, on here. But it means you have to do a little bit of editing in the web-based interface to be, able, uh, to be able to do that. It doesn't just automatically appear. You've actually got to go and spend a little more time doing things. You can make the answers have some math in them if you know how to use LaTeX, the math markup language, because you can put answers in and you put LaTeX colon and then a LaTeX command string and it, were, and it passes that. But you can't do that in the question which is irritating. You can text only in the question, but you can have math in the answer. So that's not so, that's not so great. Oh, dear. I'm just going to stop this for a sec. Get that formatting back. Uh, let's get rid of that. This is interesting. It's taking longer to come up with the answers and also not formatting them correctly. I wonder whether... Okay, look. Okay, I'm not going to bother with that. Okay, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to... There's a picture at the moment in what's called the instructions view. And I'm just going to disable that. It's got a picture of a, it's got the picture of the pulley, yes. What I'm going to do is, yeah, and it should be showing it on the, it should be showing it on the screen. I'm just gonna get rid of that. 
and see whether we can get this. The fo yeah, the photo formatting. I've only just started to use this. The photo formatting somehow is messing up with the screen display. So it worked all right in my class. On <laughs> I used exactly that slide in my class on, uh, on Friday, and it worked fine. <clears throat> so here's, this is just a conceptual question I give. Uh, because students have a lot of problems. If I throw something up in the air, it gets to the top of the trajectory and then falls back down again. And a fundamentally important uh, question is, it, what's the acceleration at the top? OK. And um, so don't worry if you can't get the answer, if you don't know the answer to this. That's not, that, that's not a problem here. The answer is that the acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity. What you've actually got is the speed, the velocity is zero, but gravity hasn't switched off. What I usually do with this is I say, I'm going to throw something in the air, hold on to your seats, because if, if we get to the top and gravity switches off, you'll all float away, right? And obviously that doesn't happen. But it's, it, it's and don't worry if you got this wrong, by the way. Aristotle got it wrong. You're in very good company. It wasn't until, it wasn't until Galileo actually worked out there was a difference between velocity which is the speed and the direction, and the acceleration, which is the rate of change of velocity. OK, so there's a subtle distinction there. OK. And this is also one of these sort of icebreakery problems as well, because really most of the students ought to know that from high school, and a lot of them don't. So it's an important one to reinforce. OK. And here we go again. So this. Yeah, so we're having trouble with the pictures, so we'll, we'll ignore that one. If you want to do a different type of um, presentation, you can use what are called clickable image questions, where you put a picture in the slide, and then students can click at a point on the image. This is actually good when you want to either use images or you want to use special characters like Greek and math and things like that. In large classes, sometimes it starts to look a bit overwhelming. Now, here we go again, of course, because I put the picture on here. The idea is this is now a bitmap. It's just a picture that you've downloaded. And you can click in various places here. And if you click inside these boxes, any one of the boxes, we should get a response. And it should say, I've uh, so you should see yeah, a green, you drop a green marker onto the bitmap. Like that, OK? And it works nicely for lots of pictures. Obviously, it's not working properly for this. I wonder whether it's the, I'm, sorry, I'm just wondering whether it's the format of my slides, which I've got a uh, different aspect ratio on this than the previous one. So I'm wondering whether that's it. So this is where students can drop a pin on the right answer. And you can see here, I can use some math symbols with arrows above and bold and, and things like that. And this works quite well, except that on screen, when you have 300 people all dropping their pins on hopefully the right answer, it gets obliterated very quickly. It's OK on the app, because it only shows your pin, not everybody else's. But it certainly obliterates the right answer um, on the screen. OK? I did find out that you've got to you have a white background for your figure on this. If you have, no, if you have a, a, a neutral or no background, the background on the app is dark blue, and basically you can't see anything. So if you've got black on nothing, so you've got to make sure that you've put a white background in if you download something. OK? And you've also got to make sure your answers are clearly separated, particularly on a small screen, because it's difficult to press in the right place to drop the pin on the right answer. So, um, gosh really is causing trouble. So, so this, one, this is one of their standard things, and it's where are you from? And so you can drop the pin wherever, wherever you're from. And I'm sorry, sort of North America has been obliterated <laughs> over there on the left. Um, I found it quite difficult to do this when I was trying to drop the pin on the UK. Um, and I kept dropping it on Ireland by mistake. Um, so it, it, you, 
it doesn't work so well when you have very large pictures. I think that's the um, uh, that's the issue there. Yeah. Okay. So presumably on the on the on the app you can see the whole you can probably see the whole screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Disadvantages, particularly for students with poor fine motor control. You know, I've got a son who has those issues, and so he would find it difficult to press the button in the right place. So that means you need large-scale pictures with very large, well-defined areas of interest. The pre-designed images that you get supplied look great, but frankly, I think most of them are pretty useless. So the periodic table one was quite nice. I'm sorry, we've only got half the periodic table here. Now, I, uh, the, what the question was, was find ruthenium, which is this one here, and drop a pin on it and see whether you can actually drop the pin in the right place. It's like, you know, fairground things. Can you sort of throw a ball into the hole or something like that? So most people here are better than I am at it. That's good. And there are various, so there are a few medical ones as well with anatomical drawings, and you could presumably say, you know, find the liver, find the spleen, or whatever else. Um, so they're quite good. Yeah. These, these, these ones are pre-loaded in there. So when you go into the thing and say bitmap images, it, it says it has a library of 20 or so of these. Uh, or it says up, upload your own image, and then so so mostly I upload my own image, but there are these ones available if you if you need that. Um, and so this one's basically a Likert scale, and there's a, there's a there's a red face and an orange face frowning on the left, and so you could, you know, how do you think it's going so far? Was my question here. Okay. Four smiley faces. Well, that's good. Okay. So that's the instantaneous feedback. All right. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mind games, yeah. Okay. Uh, speaking of mind games, here's word clouds. Okay. Um, so there's an option to have a word cloud and get people to contribute words or short phrases, and then the thing builds up on the screen as people press them in. And this is actually, it's, it looks really good, but I have to say, when I tried it with my first year engineering class, it was not that good. Um, my, my word cloud for the responses would be puerile and juvenile, I think. Um, so I, I was a bit fed up with them to be honest okay the first 20 responses were quite good and then it deteriorated very badly <clears throat> very very badly i hasten to so i so i edited the uh, you, you can record the it, it'll give you a spreadsheet of all the responses and i the first 25 were okay and then silliness be, took over and the other 75 responses were frankly well some of them were obscene so you know um, so those were the so that was the the 25 engineers who responded properly gave me a fairly nice um, uh, a fairly nice little word cloud there. So I think it depends on the class a bit, and your I, I have a feeling an upper year class might be a little a little better than that. So the size yeah, of the word, does that correspond to the it corresponds to the number of responses. So by far. The biggest response was design. I think there were four response. Four of the twenty-five were design, and then three, to, you know, and so on like that. So, so yes, and it does have an algorithm which puts the prominent ones at the front. You don't seem to be able to change the word cloud very much in terms of design and whether you get horizontal and vertical and and, and things like that. If you wanted to do that. Uh, you could download the responses and then feed them into a uh, into a better web, a better um, generator. I think uh, it was okay, but it wasn't the best word cloud design that I'd ever seen. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, this is asking you for a word cloud on clickers. I think, if I remember rightly. 
Teaching. Okay, so what what word would you associate with teaching? Let's see what let's see what you get. So I'm going to add one there as well. So everybody's got a different word there, basically, at the moment. That's all right. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. You see, and you, and you can change your response, and you could let it evolve over time. So it's quite a nice, quite a nice little system to get some key words out of a concept. Yeah. Exhausting. Yes, exactly. Yep. I think it would. I think yes. If you uh, and you can set poll everywhere up to be, so the students have to register, and that would definitely sharpen the mind a little bit. I think on responses. Yes, I I totally agree there. But yeah. No, it, 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 it shows up in the web-based interface, so you can see a class list and you'll be able to see who responded to which question and what their answer was. And if you want to, you can make answers the correct answer so that the software will say so-and-so answered four questions correctly and got so many wrong. So it does allow you to score if you want to do that. Now, I, um, I know one of my colleagues who teaches a big physics class does use that um, because, of course, it brings in attendance as well. Um, personally, I don't simply because it's a very large administrative burden. If you have 350 people emailing you saying, I can't log in, I, don't, I haven't got a user right, you know, it, it just starts to um, build up a little. So I, I personally don't use the it does but that's the exhausting bit yeah yeah <laughs> quite <clears throat> then there's a, a, a question and answer session where you can ask people to write a question that they would like answered and then the audience can actually vote which questions they think are more relevant and so you get a scoreboard of questions with them being upvoted and downvoted um, so let's try that. See what happens. I think I, I think I understand what the issue here is. No, I think this, um, the PowerPoint slides I've got, I think have been, I think have been formatted for a slide with an aspect uh, of a letterbox type aspect ratio rather than a 4-3. So I think that's what the issue is here. And I should have checked that, but it, of course it works perfectly at home. <laughs> Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. So it's, what do students think about them? I'll vote that one up. Um, whenever I've done a poll on what students think about the clickers, it's always been overwhelmingly positive. The first few years I ran one of these regularly, do you think it contributes? to the educational experience, and overwhelmingly 90% said yes, and 10% didn't. So the students like them. Engineering students like them more than the science students, gadgets, you know. Um, uh, but generally speaking, it was very positive, and the comments I've had in student evaluations 
I almost never get a negative comment about the use of clickers. I, I can't think of the last, the last time I had one, somebody just wrote clickers suck. Um, but that was about 10 years ago. Um, and since then, nobody has really said they don't like this to me. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Okay. So the physical implementation of Poll Everywhere, PowerPoint plugin, also Google Docs or Keynote, there's the web-based interface, and there's the uh, phone app interface, as we can see. Um, I, we had some trouble because there wasn't the plugin on uh, PowerPoint in the room. Normally in Carlton, in all the main lecture rooms where they have a standard um, image for the computer it's already on there and you don't have to do anything it's only in here which is this room is more like a a lab so it's you know you have to actually set it up but it didn't take Ryan more than about two or three minutes to download it and and, and set it up so it was pretty easy um, and it's free of course so if you want to work at home and, and do your things there's no problem there you don't have to come in and use the university computer so it's a good thing um, and so it just looks like this there's just an extra tab on the usual PowerPoint with poll everywhere. There's the log in and the log out. Um, this is the thing. This will add a new poll and this will insert an, exi an existing poll because you have a poll library that it stores for you. So if you want to use old questions and reuse them, you've got that capability. You don't have to redesign a new question um, every time. So that's quite handy. Uh, here's the web-based interface, so you can just log in to Poll Everywhere, and then your at, at Carlton, your user ID is the same as your normal Carlton ID, so it's all very seamless. Same password and everything if, uh, when, when it's set up. And so you can see here, for this, uh, this so this is Clicker Seminar, so these are the... Um, so these are some of the, the slides I had grouped in there. I didn't use all of these, but you can see it's got the various different types of slide as well. These little icons here represent whether they're uh, multiple choice questions or clouds or questions answers and, and, and things like that. And you can edit each of these questions and you can also move them between groups. You can clear the old answers out if you want to reuse it for a new class and, and various things like that. And it's, it's not bad. Uh, I won't say it's, it's as web-based interfaces go, I would say it's fairly, slightly better than average, you know, certainly adequate for the purpose. And then there's the phone-based uh, app here. I didn't start looking at this until a few weeks ago, and I did change the format of some of my slides to accommodate the much smaller phone format. I didn't appreciate how difficult some of the slides would be. They look fine on the big screen and on my laptop, but if people are trying to use a small interface uh, on, on a phone, um, some of the questions needed a bit of tweaking. Okay, so the most important thing, of course, is, is how to design the class around using these things and what to tell the students. Um, so I always justify to the students why we use the clickers because there's quite a lot of evidence that peer-to-peer -peer interaction, which is what we're using when we do the clicker questions, enhances retention by up to 50%. Um, there's quite a lot of work on that, um, particularly in physics, as it turns out, because there's a chap called um, Eric Mazur at Harvard who uses this uh, a lot. Uh, uh, and and it's it, it, you, can, you can demonstrate that it's very good. And as soon as you say 50% extra retention, you get a lot of buy-in. Okay. At the U of S, when I was the first year clickers, um, most of the students wanted to get into medical school. And my justification was there, the medical school uses these clickers in their classes. And from that point on, there's total buy-in because everybody wants to get into the medical school. And if they're using them, no problem. Um, so it's important to justify why you're using them to the students, otherwise they'll probably just think, what's the point, you know? So as I already said, I teach for no more than five or ten minutes. I pose a question with a clicker slide. 
I ask them to give their answer first and then to discuss with their peers and they can re-vote as they discuss it with their peers. And so you see the bar charts moving as people, people's opinion are swayed by their peers and hopefully you end up with the right answer coming out on top. Occasionally you ask a question and the majority gets the wrong answer or it's 50-50 at the start with, and then the people who are wrong are more persuasive than the people who are right. And then so the, so the wrong answer comes out on the, on the answer. And this, of course, causes great hilarity when you say, well, actually, that's completely the wrong answer. And you give them the full explanation of the correct solution. And it's very important to do that and to um, get through any common misconceptions that you've got when they're working out the problem. So it takes a few minutes to do this. So a clicker question will take five minutes to go through. They've got to get their answer, quick discussion. I have to go through the answer. So um, I certainly slow, it certainly slows me down. I can't cover the range of material that I would before, but I can cover it and get people to practice it and go up and make sure there are no misconceptions. So it slowed me down a little bit and made me more selective about what I teach. But I think it's actually made it more effective, that, that they're getting more in-depth and I'm addressing common misconceptions better than I was before. Okay. So this is roughly what one of my lectures would look, would look like. This is not the complete thing, so that's slide seven. Uh, so there's a few, we talk a little bit about stuff, and then the lighter colored one here, this is one clicker question here, and then there's a second clicker question, and you'll see there's the clicker question, and then there's an explanation slide. Sometimes there are two or three explanation slides. Um, this was about throwing a ball. Um, so obviously I get to joking about cricket being better than baseball and, you know, stuff like that. Um, uh, and then important concepts in here and then a few more slides here. So I take about a minute and a half roughly to go through a slide when I'm standing there talking. So you can see here there's about six minutes and then we do another click a question. There's a fairly long stretch here, but then, but then I show them a little video of astronauts walking on the moon. So, you know, I don't just use the clicker questions as the breakup point. Sometimes I show a simulation, uh, an app through a web browser, or if I'm able to, I do a physical demonstration of an experiment. That's more difficult because the physics department is invariably a long way away from the, where I'm actually teaching. And so getting stuff over there is a logistical effort. So that's basically how I, how I do it in these classes. The students get all the notes beforehand, except they don't get the clicker slides. So the clicker slides are a surprise. So they can review the notes beforehand. I'm not sure how many do, but it's there. Uh, and then after the class, I repost the notes, including the clicker questions and clicker solutions. So they get replaced at the end. And of course, this gives me the opportunity to insert extra material or clarify something or correct a typo as well. So it, it means at the end of the, of the session, they've got a full set of notes, which I've been able to self-correct, if you like, because, you know, they're always typos and, and, and things like that. And I can add extra material in if I need to. So that's basically how I do it um, there. So that's one unit. There's the second unit. There's the third. There's the video. So types of questions I asked. Often a key concept, so that does gravity switch off when the ball gets to the top of the trajectory. Um, simple calculations, just when I introduce a new equation, just get them used to putting the numbers in, converting units from one thing to another, that sort of stuff. Provocative questions to, prov to provoke some sort of discussion between people. So those are the types of things I, I, I ask in this, uh, in this context. And, and, and you should always make sure that you go through whatever you say and give explanations at the end. Don't just give the questions. You've actually got to give the, the final explanation to the students to wrap it up. So it's a, essentially, it's like a sort of mini seminar, really. Um, 
if I get a bad answer, sometimes I do an extra work problem on the board, on the, on the chalkboard. Um, I sometimes set extra work later because I also have assigned problems that they do. So if I, if I see a weakness in class, I can set an assigned problem for the next week to get students to go over it again and reinforce the concepts. Um, and if necessary, I will act immediately. If I see a concept has really not gone over well, I will go through it again um, uh, some other way, either on the board or a verbal explanation. So that's, my, that's the way I, I react to the clicker answers. OK. So I can't remember what I said here. I think, I think this is the any questions one. Well, maybe it's a cloud. Is it cloud? cloud? It's a cloud, right. My app is being very slow here to come up with it. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. Thoughts on clickers, yeah. So once we, go, uh, once we go away from this slide, it's saved all the data. So you can go back and retrieve it later if you want to reformat it or look at numbers of responses and, and, and things like that. So it's quite a useful system for data gathering as well as anything else. So I haven't used the... Um, I haven't used the word clouds very much. As I said, I tried them out last week and, it, you know, <laughs> well. Uh, but I think, I think uh, more mature classes and certainly non-anonymous polling would probably uh, reduce that issue. Okay, that's great. Okay, so this one must be the questions about the presentation. And don't worry if you haven't got any questions, I'm not worried. <laughs> I just thought I'd better put the, you know, normally you stand up there and say, any questions? I thought, well, if, if we, as we've got clickers with the clicker, any questions version, I ought to put that in, so. Actually, I should ask you, how do you find the interface? Is it, is it okay to use? Is it fairly simple and intuitive? Can you present directly from the web page? Yes, you can. You can. It's portable so that you don't actually have to have a... Um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. You can just go in and use those, uh, use the use the slides in the in the um, in the web-based interface. Okay, I think that's. Okay, well, thank you. I'll just. Okay, so if anybody um, has any other questions or wants to ask anything, just uh, send me um, an email. I'm at uh, Andrew Robinson at carlton.ca, and I'm in Hertzberg, and I've put an extra T in Hertzberg. That's naughty. Okay, Hertzberg. Um, and I'm quite happy to talk about it to anybody else and... Uh, give you a bit more background if I can. I've been using these now since I used the first clicker question system in 2005 so I've been using these a long time um, and I found them I found them very useful. I think my teaching has benefited because I had to think more about how to teach stuff and I think the students have benefited as well. The um, My student evaluations although of course you have to take them with a pinch of salt um, the students like the classes people you know I used to teach at 8 30 on, on a Monday morning and when people comment it's the only class only it's the only 8 30 class I could get up for then I think that's I'm doing quite a good job there so uh, <laughs> so I think it does 
help you get the students motivated and keep thinking during a whole 75 or 80 minutes of the class um, rather than just a traditional lecture. So uh, I, I have to say that I did not respond well to traditional lectures when I was an undergraduate. And so when I started teaching, I was absolutely determined not to teach in the traditional way that I'd been taught. So I'm, I may be slightly prejudiced there, but it seems to work for a majority of the students that I'm, that I'm teaching. OK, I think I'll stop there. And if there are any other questions, yeah. 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 No, I I only I only have the one account. So I I just sign in on Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's you don't you don't you download the plugin, but then you can you can just log in as your as your Carlton self. So it's pretty seamless and I I have all my presentations, I have them in the cloud so that I can get, I can access them from anywhere. So it doesn't matter to me whether I'm working at home or I'm working at Carlton. It's, it's all now perfectly seamless from that point of view, which, I, which is really nice, actually, to be, able to, to be able to do that. Yeah. If you wanted to create a question on the spot. Wow. Yeah. Yes, you could do that. You could you could go in through the through the web interface and create a question and display it uh, straight away. Um, definitely, yes, you could you could uh, you could do that. Okay. Um. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Why did it do that? Probably better if I just logged in. Do anything with that. Kind of slow from here today. It's usually much faster than this. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, yes, you can. Yeah, yeah, if you want to. Yeah. Is that quicker? It's slightly better to do it that way because if you log into the poll everywhere, yeah. Ah, right, okay, yeah, because I mean, it's not something I normally do. I, I normally do try and be reasonably prepared with the slides and not do them on the fly. This is taking a very long time. It's got stuck at the creating wormhole. <laughs> I, don't know why, I don't know why it says creating wormhole. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to give up on that. It does sound ominous, doesn't it? Yeah, you see, you can... You can add a new poll if you want to here, like that. And it will probably create it at the bottom. But then you've got multiple choice, word, cloud, question, answer. There's rank order as well. This is clickable image. There are, there are various other options that I haven't gone through as well. And so you create your question here. Um, so the answers could either be text. You could put a little image in there. You'd have to upload it from somewhere. Or you can use the latex math language um, uh, formatting there. And you could add as many types as you want. The word cloud one is here. That's easy. The clickable image one, these are the preset images you've got. There are some more as well. You have to go into the main interface, or you can upload an image from your local computer when you want to do that. If you do this, 
Um, so suppose we did this one, and you wanted a, and you want to actually say, well, which answers do you want me to click on? Then you do this, and that defines a clickable region there. And then if you want to do another one there, and then we could. I'm just not going to ask a real question there. We could do that. Let's put it right at the end. That tends to default putting the slides at the end, unless you're very careful with your positioning in the. Um, and then we could just simply go to. Now, normally there isn't this pause. This is very slow. Is that just this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you see here, now we've got two regions defined, the engine oil one and the, what did I, was it the jack I, I put it on? Now I, I notice, I think what the, oops, I think what the issue formatting is, is I've got this aspect ratio on these slides and when I have my normal ones I have the four to three ratio instead and I think that's what's somehow between the projector and the computer and so on it's it's messing up so uh, I think that's what the issue with, with is with the is with the formatting there um, anyhow so that's Basically, it's actually quite a nice system, and it's relatively easy to set up and use. Um, it's probably the easiest one to set up and use that I've that I've had a go with. I would have said Socrative, possibly slightly easier, but much less capable. So you know, um, the one thing I haven't done is tried to set this up and register the students, mostly because I just. <coughs> really don't want to have to organize 350 students all to get their own IDs and log in and then get their names imported into into this yes ah and they can go and they can go on on that okay that's oh oh good yes that's helpful Your five. Uh -huh. and, all, and I think actually it will email us these points as well. You can simply click on it and uh, post it on CU Learn and then just, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. 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 yeah, so that's actually smoother yeah. than it used yeah. to be, right? Yeah. Is it? Right, okay, yeah, yeah. Because I, I looked at that a few years ago and I thought, no, no, I'm not touching this with a barge pole because it's just, <laughs> it's just going to, I'm just going to end up with endless email exchanges. I can't do this, you know, da, da, da. And yeah. Um, oh, that's good. I might try that then sometime, particularly with word clouds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's it, really. Um, any more questions? Oh, good. Yeah. Thanks.